to uh, a presentation of research by Anissa Vega. We're very excited. Uh, I'm introducing her on behalf of the ECOE Global Engagement Committee and the university-wide Global Engagement Committee who know about this presentation today. Uh, Anissa, curriculum evaluation projects have included the Georgia Performance Standards and the Common Core Standards, Common Core State Standards. And she also has done work, as you know, in Norway. We're about to hear the results of that. And also with the Hong Kong State Curriculum. Uh, what's really exciting to know is that she's just returned from ASCD, where she presented at 8 o'clock in the morning and had 100 participants. <laughs> <laughs> and all of us know it presented. That is a great moment. <laughs> and then, since she's returned, her presentation was highlighted, one of 15 presentations highlighted at the whole conference. So I had the pleasure of reading that. And so we are really fortunate today to have you share with us the research that uh, was inspired and supported by a Global Learning Award that you received two years ago. And many times in these awards, one of the outcomes is that the research will be shared. And, I, and we're very fortunate that she's going to share that with us today. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm very flattered to see all of you here. So thank you very much for the support and encouragement. And as you know, I went to Norway, funded by the UCOE Global Engagement Award. And so I used uh, that award to conduct a study on Norway's curriculum. And this is uh, one of the presentations uh, as a result of that. And really what kind of fuels my research agenda is that we know that this world has changed uh, since the system of education here in the United States and, and abroad had, was developed. And there's many researchers and famous names who speak to this uh, phenomenon, the fact that um, our economy has changed and the types of skills that are required has changed. And, um, and anyways, many of these names, including um, Scott McLeod of UCPA and CASEL, which is a technology force bound leaders organization through UCEA, he, he directs that center. And uh, I have for you, which you can uh, look at another time, because this would actually take 15 minutes of our, of our time together. Uh, he provides a great rationale and under, uh, uh, provides really great understanding as to um, how the world has changed in, term, uh, in terms of economics and skills that are required. And, um, and you can find his TED Talk on YouTube if you just search Scott McCloud, that's M-C-L-E-O-D, on YouTube, and then you can watch that. It takes about 15 minutes. But I've provided for you some key points just so that we can breeze through that and get on to um, some other good stuff. And one is that um, schooling was designed for a different age, a different time, a different way and structure that work was um, established. And that was even prior to the industrial age. However, we haven't really changed our system of education since then in, then in a meaningful way. And we need to adjust it to fit for the new world and information networks. And McLeod also suggests that to, to do this, we first need to talk about what it is that we really want students to be able to do. What is the purpose of schooling? And then we need to write the curriculum. But we first need to establish what the purpose of schooling is. And I will say that he doesn't sound like a big fan of curriculum standards. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a big fan of curriculum standards either, but they're not going anywhere. There's certainly a uh, structural component of uh, our K-12 system. And we need to find a way to work within them, or at least start moving them in a direction that is more suitable to the global economy. And so I'm an optimist, and I'd like to say that we can start to make changes and make adjustments uh, to our curriculum and our standards in particular to help us move students in this direction so that they are better prepared to work in the knowledge economy. And first is, what's the point? We need to articulate what it is our we want our students to do. And actually, prior to 2009, here in the state of Georgia, we didn't have an articulated goal of schooling, a purpose of schooling. It wasn't written anywhere. And if you look at the document Goals 2000, I did a, a brief uh, content analysis of that. There's 17 different goals listed in Goals 2000. So it's 
it's very fuzzy. What is the purpose of schooling? Well, then in 2009, the state of Georgia did establish a list of goals. It was written on their website. And that came out with the Georgia Performance Standards. And that goal included economic participation in the state of Georgia. Well, with the Common Core, now we suddenly had a, an articulated national purpose of schooling. And that includes college and career readiness. And so, while I'm not going to try to argue whether or not that's the right goal to have for our students or the wrong goal, it is the goal that we've been given and we need to work within that and see how well we're doing at preparing students for those particular purposes. So then we need a way to assess how well or how poorly our standards are preparing students for this goal. And that didn't exist before my dissertation. <laughs> And so I used some mathematical models to develop a way to evaluate curriculum standards so that we can put them through a process of continuous improvement for a purpose or goal. And so we've got to be able to evaluate what, what we've got. Then what we need to do is we need to go out and look for models to emulate. We need to inform our revisions of our curriculum based on where the curriculum is being successful in these areas of preparing students for economic participation and college or career readiness as well. And so that's where Norway comes in. And then we already have the, uh, the research and knowledge and processes in our fields, uh, field of education here, to realign, once we have a, a curriculum, realign instruction, assessments, policies, teacher training, and so forth. But all of this needs to move towards a common goal. And so how do we pick a model to investigate? To, where's our starting point? What school are we going to, school system are we going to look at to start looking at what we want to emulate? How we can revise our curriculum to do a better job in these particular goals? And some of the uh, information that I used to make this decision to go to Norway was actually, I pulled the PISA scores from uh, the latest ones from 2009. And believe it or not, everyone thinks that Finland is the very best, but actually Norway did better. Um, and the U.S. actually ranks 14th. So Norway is actually, since the 2000 iteration of, or 2006 iteration of that test, has actually dramatically increased, and they did have a curriculum revision between that time. Also, I wanted to look at, because we were talking about economic factors and economic participation, I wanted to look at gross domestic product per capita. So where do they have the highest standard of living? And in particular, the U.S., we actually only rank sixth. I know everyone here is we're the richest nation in the world, but um, I certainly know there's a big difference between a family of four living off $100,000 and a family of, of five or six or seven and so forth. Per capita really makes the difference of um, um, your, your standard of living. And there's only two countries that consistently exceed the United States in both of these measures, and that's Norway and Switzerland. In Switzerland, in particular, their education system is divided up in 26 different cantons or districts, type state type uh, organizations, and each of those still have control over their curriculum. So there's 26, 26 different curricula in Switzerland. So it wasn't very convenient, <laughs> although it's still probably a great model at some point to go look at. It wasn't very convenient for a single researcher to go um, and investigate. However, Norway has a single national curriculum. So it was an excellent site for me to investigate. So let me give you an overview of Norwegian school system. First, as I already mentioned, they had significant improvements in their PISA scores um, in the 2009 iteration of that test. Mandatory education, they have to complete their 10th year of education. So it's not that they have to stay in school until they're 16, they actually have to complete the curriculum of the 10th year. And so, that alone is a difference, a, a small nuance between the U.S. and Norway that can make a big difference as to what curricula the students are accessing. Upper secondary education is an additional three years. And so actually they, they end up with an extra year of schooling in the end. And there's very, very few privately funded schools, mostly all state schools. They are selected. They offer specialties. And uh, so they can pick their students and students apply. And the money follows those students. Now what you get is every student gets a certain basic value uh, or dollar amount that follows that child to the school. 
And then, in addition, any child that has additional needs that may cost more, they get a supplemental amount of money that comes with their funding. So, schools have developed in Norway to really target specific needs and, and um, talents of children or interests. And so what you get is maybe one school in downtown Oslo that is extremely competitive for extremely promising, very bright students who have performed very well. And they, that school is getting the basic funding, the very basic for every one of their students. But, they all, but they're all, getting that, that amount for every, for every child. But then you may go to the outskirts of town where there's a higher uh, immigrant population. And what you'll get is uh, a school that's receiving significantly more funding per child. And the facilities and the expertise of the teachers and the pay of the teachers is very different from that school where the students were, um, where it was very, very selective for academic performance. They have annual standardized tests as well, um, but they're both written and oral. And teachers are trusted to evaluate those, and the student success in those uh, tests. And that's going to be a key point, um, I think, sometime in the future when we look at our standardized tests and how they're actually, they may actually be driving our curriculum. If instead we start with a goal and then we revise our curriculum, it's going to force our tests to be adjusted to better suit that curriculum. And that's what's happened in Norway. Next, they have a clear purpose. I interviewed several teachers, administrators, conducted focus groups, and it was clear. The purpose of schooling in Norway is that every student should be able to think for themselves. Everyone agreed. It wasn't a mixed response. It was very clear. There's also a staunch cultural value for social justice and equity, and, and that drives a lot of the design and practice that we see in man mandatory education years. And so those are, those are some components that are very different. And so when I evaluate the Norwegian curriculum, it's in the frame of the American context, what we are looking for. We want to see what value we can get out of their curriculum to inform our curriculum. We can't necessarily in, um, use the analysis that I've done at this point to tell Norway how well they're doing at their particular goal, because that's not what I measured. I measured how well their curriculum is achieving our goals. And so these are some of the schools I visited. Unfortunately, it looks like my PowerPoint got a little messed up there. But um, here's an example. This particular school down here in the corner, Roman School, this is the one that has students from over 160 different nations. And they speak over 80 different languages. And when you go into that building, it is beautiful. It is incredible. They have services for parents there. They have um, uh, the teacher support and the structure of the building is actually there, especially established to support students as they go from low level Norwegian and English language speaking to higher level. And so the value, I mean it was beautifully clean, it was just lovely. And it really speaks to the students that we value you. Your learning is important to us. And, and it was just incredible. And then the, um, the school where the very high performing students were competing to attend, it was clean, lovely, but it was very simple with limited technology, actually. So, uh, step one, which I've already suggested, that we need to articulate what it is that we want to do here in the United States with our curriculum and in Georgia. In particular, I've already noted that whether we like it or not, it's been articulated for us. It's college and career readiness. And in Georgia, preparation for employment is included in the goals that were listed in 2009. And it's important to note that less than 6% of jobs, so when we talk about students being prepared for employment, less than 6% are even addressing low-skill labor. We really need creative problem solvers uh, for the knowledge economy. Why am I not focusing on college readiness? Well, in particular because we have not defined very well what that means. It's not clear as to what it means to be successful in college. What we do know is what it takes to get accepted into college. And so we're looking at these SAT, ACT scores, and so forth. But if we want to take it a step further, such that students are preparing them to be successful in college, that may mean something different. 
and we've not articulated that as a field. Now there are many organizations and uh, agencies that define what it means to work in the knowledge economy and what skills you need to be able to be successful in that. And so uh, the method that I developed I called the GCAM, Goal Curriculum Alignment uh, Measures Method. And I have for you a code book in yellow just so that you can kind of see uh, what it is. Um, it's, it comes from content analysis and I'll talk a little bit more although not in too much detail today, um, about the method. But what I had to do is I had to use the literature to try to find all the themes or skills that are necessary. And I sometimes they overlap, but I wanted it to be exhaustive. So I wanted to know what are all the skills that are necessary. And so this is the list that I came up with using the literature. And if I was doing this for a, a, another school system or another audience, I would be sure that the audience that is revising those, those curriculum standards agreed with what, what this included. But for the case of, of my work, I, I get to decide what it includes, and I've tried to use literature to be exhausted in that. Creativity, digital literacy, English language literacy, information literacy, interpersonal skills of working in a learning society, working with other people, the intrapersonal skills of lifelong learning, teaching yourself, media literacy, numeracy, problem solving, and systems thinking. What I've already analyzed includes the Georgia Performance Standards, the Common Core, then I aggregated that data to get the uh, CCGPS, the Norwegian National Curriculum, and then I disaggregated that data to get the Norwegian e equivalent to their English math, so it was English Norwegian in math. And I didn't write Norwegian on there, but it's included. And it's all based on this, uh, this, this new framework that I propose, okay? The idea is that curriculum alignment research is really focused on the written, taught, and tested curriculum. And we look for the relationship between each of these components. The written curriculum being that intended curriculum set of standards. The taught curriculum is really what happens in the classroom, the instructional materials, what the teacher does to enact that, that written curriculum. And then the tested curriculum, and we see that in uh, our standardized tests, or sometimes benchmark testing and so forth. What I argue, is that we could be going, we could have perfect alignment and be going nowhere with that curriculum. What we need to do is we need to put the goal back into the, the system of education. And if we put the goal at the center, then we can start identifying and measuring the relationship between the goal and the written curriculum, or between the goal and the taught curriculum and the test curriculum. And so far I've developed math, the mathematical models in order to uh, identify and measure the relationship between the goal and the written curriculum. And if you would like a lot of information, I have excessive amounts of information on very specific mathematical models related to this. Um, but I'll just give you an overview, um, and then I'll get to why this is important and valuable. First, it builds off of Andrew Porter's surveys of enacted curriculum, as well as Fenwick English's curriculum audit. So it's not something I just came up with out of the clear blue. It's well informed. It has roots in content analysis, <coughs> and in particular, not only Neurendorf's work, but Krippendorf's work. And Krippendorf had um, developed a specific type of content analysis called hypothesis testing, where uh, that, that type of testing was used to analyze World War II media for various types of propaganda. And so I, I, I reinvented that method and adjusted it to fit for curriculum standards. I used multiple coders, uh, so test for reliability, um, I have uh, I've written a manuscript to publish this method, and so I'm working on getting that out, and then I'm also presenting it, although via a teleconference, <laughs> uh, in San Francisco uh, this next month. All right, I'm going to pass through um, most of uh, the mathematical modeling, but I do want to show this little piece here. Um, because what I don't think, what's really unfortunate is that um, this is a little bit hard to see. While I'm not going to talk just about the English and math curricula, these are the two that are disaggregated for that, but right here we have the Norwegian curriculum and the Georgia performance standards. Prior to adopting the CCGPS, were actually pretty comparable. However, when we adopted the Common Core, we actually reduced our relevancy. So that's something to consider, but we have some specific reasons why that happened, and um, 
And so it's just unfortunate, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and it tells us some, some things. But I'll, I'll get into some more depth. So more specifically, here in blue is the Georgia Performance Standards, the curriculum we had prior to adopting the CCGPS. In red is the CCGPS. And um, in green is the Norwegian curriculum. And at first, it looks like we're, we're doing pretty equal with the Norwegians. In fact, if you look at the GPS when it comes to English language literacy and information literacy, I mean, they, they were knocking it out of the park, okay? But what we see in the Norwegian curriculum that we don't see in either the CC GPS or the GPS is that the Norwegians have representation in every column, in every area, okay? So every theme, every skill is being addressed in Norway, whereas there are many, especially creativity, completely zero, not evident, does not appear in the curriculum here in the United States and in Georgia. And so what this, why this is still great and useful for us is that what we have now are examples of curriculum standards that meet this. And we can use those examples to inform our revisions. And so what I like to ask is if we look at the Common Core uh, mission statement, it says that, um, the, that we're, this set of curriculum standards are robust and relevant to the real world. And I argue that maybe they're not. <laughs> um, they reflect the knowledge and skills that our young people need for success in college and careers. And I argue that we're actually failing in that regard. And that um, we are not preparing our communities to be best positioned to compete in global markets. And that we need to revise our curriculum to do so. So let's first celebrate, okay? We're doing something great, and that's information literacy, actually. That's well represented in the standards. It was better represented in the Georgia Performance Standards than it is in the Common Core, but it is, it's still represented in our students are gaining information literacy. Our math and English curricula could be stronger, but they're not completely irrelevant, whereas some of the other subjects have mass percentages of irrelevancy. So why does it matter how a curriculum standard is written? <laughs> Some people may think it doesn't even matter. Um, and so what I have for you um, that I'll, I'll just uh, pass out uh, is that um, curriculum standards, actually I need one of those. <laughs> um, anytime we look at different uh, new textbooks or, or teacher help books or different books that come out through AURA or ASCD or maybe even your, your math organization or uh, early childhood organization, the titles in the text that are coming out say things like how to integrate 21st century skills into the Common Core. In fact, that in particular is so prominent in the text right now, it tells us, without even looking at the data that I provide using mathematical modeling, that it's not already in there. And yet we think it's important and we value it. But in addition, um, if it's not in the, the, the standards, do you think it's really going to get tested or taught? And how teachers interpret this curriculum is critically important as well. And I've provided for you uh, an example of how teachers are being supported in analyzing or interpreting curriculum. And what you'll notice, this is called Common Core Learning Objectives and Essential Tools. And I won't mention the organization that puts this textbook out. Um, they provide it in um, multiple grade levels and subjects for all the Common Core. But what they provide us with is the list of standards, and then they write in a, a learning objective for us, okay, and provide some teaching tips next to that to try to help the teacher interpret the standards. But what you'll notice is that they don't become more complex in any case. They only become simpler. So if you expect for a teacher to take a curriculum standard that has the potential to include creativity, and you hope that they'll do that, the reality of it is, is it's most likely that they are not going to make it more complex. They're going to make it simpler. They're going to simplify it. And so it's going to go from a more complex statement to a more basic statement. Now, in addition, these particular learning objectives aren't really learning objectives, for those of you in my department know. <laughs> it has to have all four parts and they're missing conditions and degrees. It's basically just a behavior. But that's not really the point. <laughs> the point is that it's, it's um, that, that the standards are interpreted 
at a lower level, and we can't assume that they're going to be, uh, become more complex. So, we're also discouraged to make the standards more complex, because now, if you add creativity to a curriculum standard after the fact, okay, now you have a written standard that includes creativity, However, all the materials have, ever, have already been aligned for a curriculum standard without creativity. Now you've reduced your alignment by including cre creativity in your learning objective. So there's no incentive to add it after the fact. It has to be included from the beginning. So let's get better. So let's reduce the amount of irrelevant content found in our subjects, especially the subjects outside of English and math. We need all subjects to address more of the skills and themes that are necessary for the careers in today's economy. And we have some really big gaps. But Norway can help us. This particular example can help us. One of the points I also wanted to make was that um, the CCGPS for one grade, eighth grade, we have 364 standards. The Norwegians, for an equivalent grade, have 157 standards. So we have significantly more standards and yet we're less successful at getting our students to our goal. So what would we do with an analysis of Norway's curriculum and an analysis of the US curriculum or Georgia's curriculum? Well, what we can do is we can use it to inform our own revisions, okay? So here's an example that, that I, I give for you. And first I ask you, it asks, and this is a 6th to 8th grade standard in English language arts. And it says, develop the topic with relevant, well-chosen facts, definitions, concrete details, quotations, or other information and examples. A relatively equivalent Norwegian standard reads, use various media, sources, and aesthetic expressions in personal texts relating to the Norwegian subject, curriculum, and interdisciplinary text. And I highlighted while there are other themes also being addressed in this standard, more than just in, um, language, but also creativity, aesthetic expressions, and personal texts. And if you look at how um, the code book is, is structured, creativity is uh, right on the, is the very first one for you, you can see that if it's going to represent or support creativity, that the curriculum standard um, is required requires the learner to express originality of thought in an area of student of student initiated interest. Okay, you can see that that does not exist in the Common Core example. All right, but by making it a personal text to the student, uh, the Norwegians have provided an opportunity for the student to have something more relevant to themselves and original. Um, also, you're going to see aesthetic expression and. Uh, while in this case it is bounded by uh, a specific set of subjects, that does provide a somewhat supports, this Norwegian curriculum somewhat supports in that column, if you want to look at that column, it, it also somewhat supports creativity. And so this is an example where we can pull some language that will help us revise a curriculum standard. So here, for example, this is how I've suggested we might go about revising that particular curriculum standard. First, we could add that it was a student-initiated topic, okay? And we would take out this piece about facts, definitions, concrete details that's extremely limiting. And let's add in that we're gonna ask students to use various media sources and aesthetic expressions, just like they did in the Norwegian example. And so what we get is we get a curriculum standard that's more complex, that addresses creativity, and is less likely to be boiled down to an incredibly simple, uh, less effective curriculum standard. So then when we have a curriculum standard that's more complex, that addresses more themes, how does that affect the way the curriculum is taught? How does that affect the way that it's tested as well? Because this makes it difficult to test with a, uh, with a bubble and sheet, right? So as we write curriculum standards that are better suited to the goals of our education system, we then know how best to revise and realign the system. So I'm not going to ask you guys to do this, because uh, this is just a presentation, but this is what I did 
at um, ASCD this month. And I gave everyone uh, this off-white handout. And, um, and what I asked them to do is I took them through examples of how the revision process would take place. Uh, giving them, uh, on that, the first example is the creativity example, which I've already walked you through. You can see the Norwegian curriculum standard, and then the original standard for um, the Common Core. And what we can do is we can revise that using the language that we identify as most valuable in the Norwegian standard. And then that informs other components of our of system and the instruction, and the assessment, differentiation, and so forth. And so if I look back at this example, do you think that students who successfully develop a topic, who write on this, do you think they would also successfully uh, be able to develop a relevant topic with well-chosen facts? Are we preventing them from achieving this by adding additional skills? Probably not. We're probably still supporting them in the more basic standards, but we're providing them with a more robust curriculum that better prepares them for the knowledge economy. And so I provide more examples, some of the language we would use for digital literacy. This was also an example, um, a, a standard that, or a theme, I'm sorry, that was more evident in the Georgia Performance Standards than it is in the Common Core, although it was kind of weak in the Georgia Performance Standards, honestly. But, uh, but at least it included things like when, when appropriate, use digital tools or something to that effect. But now it's just completely not evident in the Common Core. So including things like digital representation. When we talk about interpersonal participation in a learning society, they actually ask students to participate in the projects together. Participation, that word alone. Adapting their work to different recipients. The, and that actually also speaks to the importance of, of global <laughs> initiatives, too. Uh, the importance of being able to work with different types of people. Here's a great one. <laughs> Uh, the Common Core says spell correctly. Imagine how simplified that gets when you turn it into a, an instructional objective. But in Norway, here were some sets of uh, uh, some language that we could use to revise that one. Describe and assess his or her own work in learning English. Okay, so maybe in learning spelling, we could say. All right, uh, we want them to use this knowledge in his or her own language learning. Give grounds for personal choices. We want them to, based on knowledge and reading strategies that they're aware of. Those are all things that we could do to enrich that spelling standard. Media literacy, also similar, ter sim similar terminology. We want them to assess their sources critically. Different sources might present history in a different way. Um, internet and mass media use that in a critical manner. We could add all of that content to this first, uh, to this current Common Core standard, which says cite specific textual evidence to support analysis of science and technical texts. So here's one from the Common Core Georgia Performance Standards, and this is for. Um, oh, we'll have the one below describe the rights and responsibilities of citizens. Okay, the second. Well, if we ask instead for students to plan and carry out um, a problem-oriented sociological survey, like the Norwegians ask their students, assess the process, and then um, in, and in particular what I noticed when it came to problem solving, where in the Common Core, we, there were so many opportunities to ask students to plan the process, the scientific process, the investigation process, to plan a project, but instead we told them explicitly in the standards to follow precisely multi-step process. Well, unfortunately with that, do you think that that's going to get more complex and ask the students to be the ones to design that multi-step process? Or do you think it's more likely that the teacher is going to give them a five-step scientific process that the student is going to follow? And they're going to be judged on how well they follow that versus invent that plan. Systems thinking, uh, and here I don't know that we have to go to the level that the Norwegians did with let's just start with the universe, but that that is also ex um, excellent value. Um, but 
talking about different theories, looking at how any concept, in this case they use the economy, how any concept is connected to the global concept. Okay, so here in Georgia we have, the student will explain the benefits of free trade. What a lost opportunity. We haven't talked about the consequences of free trade, why there might be a fair trade organization that's pushing for fair trade policies. We don't know how free trade interacts with other systems of trade. But if instead we actually ask students to explain how the system of free trade fits into the global economy, they're going to learn a lot more about how to interact in that global economy. And you can see how people who argue that the curriculum is uh, really just pushing cultural reproduction, that it, it really looks that way when we find examples of curriculum standards that don't even ask students to challenge um, a particular concept such as free trade. It, it does look like we are all religiously purchasing the idea that free trade is the best and there are no other alternatives. But the Norwegians want students to think for themselves. We can also take this a step further in the process of revision. And we can actually, in one curriculum standard, address multiple skills necessary, including in this example, I think we could stretch this, this example of about straight lines and, um, and figures to include digital literacy, information literacy, and numeracy. And, uh, and some of the terms that we would use um, are reflected in the Norwegian example. We can also do this for other grades, other than just 8th uh, eighth, eighth grade or 10th grade, the examples I've been showing you. And then, but what's important about this is that once the curriculum standards are revised to better suit the needs or the outcomes that we want for students, then that should, based on what we already know about alignment, should trickle down into the other systems, the other components of the system. And so, Hopefully, we would see an effect in, um, in terms of instruction, instructional materials, testing, types of testing, teacher preparation, and so forth. And so how might that change this bar graph? Um, I think that we can be better than the Norwegians. I think it's definitely possible. Um, but the Norwegians are definitely doing something right by addressing all of the things necessary to help their students compete for these high-skilled jobs, which are the jobs that are available. And our companies are moving, are moving away to these countries where um, students are able to perform. Also in revising, we can better achieve our mission to have this robust and relevant real-world curriculum to help our students better compete in the global economy. And so then, uh, of course, step four, I already mentioned, we would go through that realignment process which we already have the research and the processes established for that. We've just missed the goal. And so I propose we just revise the Concord. <laughs> okay, no big deal. But I think we can do it. And um, in particular, I think we can do it by starting by artic articulating the goal, defining the things that are necessary within that goal, conducting the GCAM analysis on what we already have to identify that irrelevant curriculum, then looking for those other models, such as Norway, I, I'd like to look at Hong Kong. There's some other curricula that I plan to, to, to look at at some point. And then follow, uh, using those four revisions, then follow up with another analysis to see what kind of improvement we've made. And so that's just the continuous improvement curriculum revision process I recommend. So I have detailed references available should you need those. Uh, I do want to thank the committee for awarding me <laughs> uh, the Global Engagement Award. This project would not have been possible without that. And also, Dr. Dear Moen um, out of Twin School in Norway, who um, was my contact there and provided me with uh, access to many teachers and administrators in Oslo, who I got to interview, meet, visit their schools, and really understand the system such that I would accurately represent it. Any questions? certainly um, say with the passion that she feels that um, the comparative study that was done in terms of global research on this critical topic that everybody's, you know, 
desperate to um, address <clears throat> was beautiful. Thank you. And I'd like to say that our dean is the one <laughs> who awards the global engagement <laughs> uh, <laughs> awards. And I think it speaks to why, why they're so critical. Other comments or questions? It's just refreshing to hear some very relevant research being conducted in the college. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. So, Anita, do you think you have some um, avenues of sharing this with some of our K 12 partners in ways that will help them better understand what they're trying to do with Common Core as it relates to what they're doing in all this? Well, I'm certainly hoping to establish those relationships so that. <laughs> So that um, my voice is heard, and the work that um, I've, I've been working on uh, is valued. But uh, as a, a new assistant professor, <laughs> it's new work. So I, if anyone does have those connections to help help me, I would uh, I would be delighted to try to assist, especially starting right here in Georgia uh, in revision for more, a more relevant curriculum. I think that's possible, and this is because. Several years ago, when the GPS was being revised, we were able to include the language that you pointed out as appropriate for the digital literacy and things like that. That was actually coming out of KSU because they were revising the GPS at the time and asked us to put the technology components into the GPS, which is probably why there were, was more in the GPS than there are in the CC GPS. So we have a pretty strong relationship with CNI as a result of our curriculum instruction work with the DOE. So might be that we could connect you with the DOE folks and they could begin some curriculum revisions um, with us. That'd be great. Historically, it's been uh, a very political process in deciding what goes into the curriculum standards and I think that we can step away from that and make it a more systematic process and more objective. And so, but we didn't really have a way to measure it before and so we didn't have a starting point. So, um, so that's hopefully what I've I, I like your sorry, I like your special approach by taking uh, the American way of setting up curriculum standards and then uh, look at other countries uh, in a very positive sense that uh, what can we learn from other countries rather than criticizing what others do not do. <laughs> And there's no need to right. criticize right. because um, had they asked me, had Norway asked me to review their curriculum for helping students to think for themselves, right. that would be a totally other analysis that would help them identify what standards are irrelevant in their curriculum in pursuit of that goal. But what, what I do when I look at the curriculum standards from another country is to help us do better, to find the great little nuggets and pieces that they have that we can learn from. I'm sure that when the other countries establish their curriculum, they look at the need of their, their own country. What is the goal and purposes of well, what they plan for, for their citizens to look like? So it is very difficult to make that kind of comparison, but you make it work. So. And I did at ASC, we actually have quite a bit of um, uh, feedback from the who attended my session, and uh, they were very, uh, a great variety of international uh, groups represented who were interested in possibly having me conduct a, an analysis for their curriculum to support a revision process. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on building a database system that will allow me to house all uh, of the coding work over time such that what I hope to eventually have is a database, a warehouse of curriculum standards and language that anytime, we, if we want to change our goal here in the United States, if we want to change it to be for democracy, if we decide that that's what we want students to be able to do to participate in democracy, then we could pull from that database to find new language to help with revision to pursue that goal. Also, implications for what we do is in our work with preparing teachers. We need to be looking at this, at these data, 
in taking into account things that we can do better to improve what teachers do in the classroom, even though they don't have these standards to, to work by. We can use the, this, the GCAM method, this way to analyze a curriculum or evaluate a curriculum, even to inform a program's curriculum uh, within our college. On a national and international level, I just think it would be very exciting to work with those organizations where these, uh, you know, the, 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 the standards, the partnership for 21st century skills, the, those organizations that are trying to advocate these changes and use your data, I think they would be very interested in the data to have a, a more objective um, rationale that these are not in the curriculum and how to get them into the curriculum. So it would be, I think there's that national, but it's kind of pushing change from the other end you know, the people, the advocates, and um, I think that, that hooking up with them would be really interesting too. Anybody else? So you wanna? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's good. And she had the baby first. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.